Welcome back to GCC Kids Connection, where we are connecting with each other while you're home from school, we're connecting with some really cool books, and most importantly, we're connecting with God's Word. We're so glad you're here. Well, hi kids, welcome back. Well, last time uh, when we left Wilbur and Charlotte, it was nighttime and Wilbur was trying to stay up a little bit later and Charlotte was reminding him he needed to go to bed and get his rest. Well, today we're ready to begin with chapters 10 and 11 in our book called Charlotte's Web by E.B. White. And chapter 10 is called An Explosion. Wonder what that's all about. Let's find out. Day after day, the spider waited, head down, for an idea to come to her. Hour by hour, she sat motionless, deep in thought. Having promised Wilbur that she would save his life, she was determined to keep her promise. Charlotte was naturally patient. She knew from experience that if she waited long enough, a fly would come to her web, and she felt if she thought long enough about Wilbur's problem, an idea would come to her mind. Finally, one morning toward the middle of July, the idea came to her. Why, how perfectly simple, she said to herself. The way to save Wilbur's life is to play a trick on Zuckerman. If I can fool a bug, thought Charlotte, I can surely fool a man. People are not as smart as bugs. Wilbur walked into his yard at just that moment. What are you thinking about, Charlotte? he asked. I was just thinking, said the spider, that people are very gullible. What does gullible mean? Easy to fool, said Charlotte. Oh, that's a mercy, replied Wilbur, and he lay down in the side of his fence and went fast asleep. The spider, however, stayed wide awake, gazing affectionately at him and making plans for his future. Summer was half gone, and she knew she didn't have much time. The next morning, just as Wilbur fell asleep, Avery Arbel in, wandered into the Zuckerman's front yard, followed by Fern. Avery carried a live frog in his hand. Fern had a crown of daisies in her hair. The children ran into the kitchen. Just in time for a piece of blueberry pie, said Mrs. Zuckerman. Look at my frog, said Avery, placing the frog on the drain board and holding out his hand for pie. Take that thing out of here, said Mrs. Zuckerman. He's hot, said Fern. He's almost dead, that frog. He is not, said Avery. He lets me scratch between his eyes. The frog jumped and landed in Mrs. Zuckerman's dishpan full of soapy water. You're getting your pie on you, said Fern. Can I look for eggs in the hen house, Aunt Edith? Run outdoors, both of you, and don't bother the hens. It's getting all over everything, shouted Fern. His pie's all over his front. Come on, frog, cried Avery. He scooped up his frog. The frog kicked, splashing soapy water onto his blueberry pie. Another crisis, groaned Fern. Let's swing on the swing, said Avery. The children ran to the barn. Mr. Zuckerman had the best swing in the county. It was a single long piece of heavy rope tied to a beam on the north doorway in the barn. At the bottom end of the rope was a big fat knot to sit on. It was arranged so that you could swing without being pushed. You climbed a ladder into the hayloft, then holding the rope, you stood at the edge and looked down and were scared and dizzy. Then you straddled the knot so that it acted like a seat. Then you would get up all of your nerve, take a deep breath, and jump. For a second, you seemed to be falling to the barn floor far below, but then suddenly the rope would begin to catch and you would sail through the barn door going a mile a minute with the wind whistling in your eyes and your ears and your hair. Then you would zoom up into the sky and look up into the clouds and the rope would twist and you would twist and turn with the rope. Then you would drop back down, 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 down out of the sky and come sailing back through the barn door almost to the hayloft. Then you'd sail back out again, not quite as far this time. Then you would sail back in again, in and out, in and out, and then you'd jump off, jump off and fall down and let somebody else take a turn. Mothers for miles around worried about Zuckerman's swing. They feared some child would fall off. But no child ever did. Children almost always hang on to things tighter than their parents think they will. 
Avery put the frog in his pocket and climbed the hayloft. The last time I swang on this swing, I almost crashed into a barn swallow, he yelled. Take that frog out, shouted Fern. Avery straddled the rope and jumped. He sailed out through the door, frog and all, into the sky, frog and all. Then he sailed back into the barn. Your tongue is purple, screamed Fern. So's yours, said Avery, sailing back out with his frog. I have hay inside my dress. It itches, said Fern. Scratch it, yelled Avery as he sailed back in. It's my turn, said Fern. Jump off. Fern got the itch. Fern got the itch, sang Avery. When he jumped off and threw the swing up to his sisters, she shut her eyes tight and jumped. She felt dizzy as she dropped down and then the supporting lift of the swing. When she opened her eyes, she was looking up into the blue sky and was about to fly back in through the door. They took turns for hours. When the children grew tired of swinging, they went down toward the pasture and picked wild raspberries and ate them. Their tongues turned from purple to red. Fern bit into a raspberry that had a bad-tasting bug inside it and got discouraged. Avery found an empty candy box and put his frog in it. The frog seemed tired after his morning of swinging. The children walked slowly up toward the barn. They too were tired and had hardly had enough energy to walk. Let's build a tree house, suggested Avery. I want to live in a tree with my frog. I'm going to go visit Wilbur, Fern announced. She climbed the fence into the lane and walked lazily toward the pig pen. Wilbur heard her coming and got up. Avery noticed the spider web, and coming closer, he noticed Charlotte. Hey, look at that big spider, he said. It's tremendous. You leave it alone, commanded Fern. You got a frog, isn't that enough? That's a fine spider, and I'm going to capture it, said Avery. He took the cover off his candy box, and then he picked up a stick. I'm going to knock that old spider right into my box, he said. <gasps> Wilbur's heart almost stopped when he saw what was going on. This might be the end of Charlotte if that boy succeeded in catching her. You stop it, Avery, said Fern. Avery put one leg over the fence of the pig pen, and he was just about to raise his stick up to hit Charlotte when he lost his balance. He swayed and toppled and landed on the edge of Wilbur's trough. The trough tipped up and came down with a slap. The goose egg was right underneath. There was a dull explosion as the egg broke, and then a horrible smell. Fern screamed. Avery jumped to his feet. The air was filled with the terrible gases and smells from a rotten egg. Templeton, who had been resting in his home, scuttled away into the barn. Good night, screamed Avery. Good night! What a stink! Let's get out of here! Fern was crying. She held her nose and ran toward the house. Avery ran after her, holding his nose. Charlotte felt greatly relieved to see him go. It had been a narrow escape. Later on that morning, the animals came up from the pasture, the sheep, the lambs, the gander, the goose, and the seven goslings. There were many complaints about the awful smell, and Wilbur had to tell the story over and over again of how the arbor boy had tried to capture Charlotte and how the smell of the broken egg had driven him away. It was the rotten egg that saved Wilbur's life, said, or that saved Charlotte's life, said Wilbur. <sighs> the goose was proud of her share in this adventure. I'm delighted that the egg never hatched, she gobbled. Templeton, of course, was miserable over the loss of his beloved egg, but he couldn't resist boasting. It pays to save things, he said in his surly voice. A rat never knows when something is going to come in handy. I never throw anything away. Well, said one of the lambs, this whole business is all well and good for Charlotte, but what about the rest of us? The smell is unbearable. Who wants to live in a barn that is perfumed with rotten egg? Don't worry, you'll get used to it, said Templeton. He sat up and pulled wisely at his long whiskers, and then he crept away to pay a visit to the dump.
When Lurvy showed up at lunchtime carrying a pail of food for Wilbur, he stopped short a few paces from the pig pen. He sniffed the air and made a face. What in thunder, he said, setting the pail down. He picked up a stick that Avery had dropped and pried the trough up. Rats, he said. Phew, I might have known a rat would have a nest under this trough. Oh, how I hate a rat. And Lurvy dragged Wilbur's trough across the yard and kicked some dirt into the rat's nest, burying the broken egg and all of Templeton's other possessions. Then he picked up the pail. Lurvy stood in the trough, drooling with hunger. Lurvy poured and the slops ran creamily down around the pig's ears and eyes. Wilbur grunted. He gulped and sucked and sucked and gulped, making swishing and swooshing noises, anxious to get every bit. It was a delicious meal. Skim milk, wheat middlings, leftover pancakes, half a donut, the rind of a summer squash, two pieces of stale toast, and a third of a ginger snap, a fish tail, one orange peel, several noodles from a noodle soup, and scum off a cu cup of cocoa, an ancient jelly roll, and strips of paper that lined the garbage pail. Oh, and a spoonful of raspberry jello. Wilbur ate heartily. He planned to leave half a noodle and a few drops of milk for Templeton, and then he remembered that the rat had been useful in saving Charlotte's life, so he saved a whole noodle instead of a half. Now that the broken egg was buried, the air cleared and the barn smelled good again. The afternoon passed and evening came. Shadows lengthened and the cool and kindly breath of evening entered through the doors and the windows. Astride her web, Charlotte sat moodily eating a horsefly and thinking about the future. After a while, she bestirred herself. She descended to the center of her web and there she began to cut some of her lines. She worked slowly and steadily, but while the other creatures dozed, None of the others, not even the goose, noticed what she was doing. Deep in the soft bed, Wilbur snoozed. Over in their favorite corner, the goslings whistled the night song. Charlotte tore quite a section out of her web, leaving an open space in the middle. Then she started something to weave something to take their place. When Templeton got back from the dump around midnight, the spider was still at work. The next day was foggy. Everything on a farm was dripping wet. The grass looked like a magic carpet and the asparagus patch looked like a silver forest. On foggy mornings, Charlotte's web was truly a thing of beauty. This morning, each thin strand was decorated with dozens of tiny beads of water. The web glistened in the light and made a pattern of loveliness and mystery like a delicate veil. Even Lurvy, who wasn't particularly interested in beauty, noticed the web when he came with the pig's breakfast. He noted how clearly it showed up, and he noted how big and carefully built it was. And then he took another look and saw something that made him set the pail down. There in the center of the web, neatly woven in block letters, was a message. It said, Some pig! Lurvy felt weak. Oh, he brushed his hand across his eyes and stared harder at, Wilbur, at Charlotte's web. I'm seeing things, he whispered. He dropped to his knees and uttered a short prayer, and then, forgetting about Wilbur's breakfast, he walked back to the house and called Mr. Zeckerman. I think you better come down to the pig pen, he said. What's the trouble? asked Mr. Zeckerman. Anything wrong with the pig? Uh, not exactly, said Lurvy. Come and see for yourself. The two men walked silently down to Wilbur's yard. Lurvy pointed to the spider web. Do you see what I see? he asked. Zuckerman stared at the writing on the web, and then he murmured the words, Some pig. Then he looked at Lurvy. Then he looked back at the, at the web. Then they both began to tremble. Charlotte, sleepy after her night's exertion, smiled as she watched. Wilbur came and stood directly under her web. Some pig, muttered Lurvy in a low voice. Some pig, whispered Mr. Zuckerman. They stared and stared for a long time at Wilbur, and then they stared at Charlotte. You don't suppose that spider, began Mr. Zuckerman, but he shook his head and didn't finish the sentence. 
Instead, he walked solemnly back to the house and spoke to his wife. Edith, something has happened, he said in a weak voice. He went into the living room and sat down, and Mrs. Zuckerman followed. I've got something to tell you, Edith, he said. You better sit down. Mrs. Zuckerman sank into her chair. She looked pale and frightened. Edith, he said, trying to keep his voice steady. I think you had best be told that we have a very unusual pig. A look of complete bewilderment came over Mrs. Zuckerman's face. Homer Zuckerman, what in the world are you talking about, she said. This is very serious, Edith, he replied. Our pig is completely out of the ordinary. What's so unusual about the pig, asked Mrs. Zuckerman, who was beginning to recover from her scare. Well, I don't really know yet, said Mr. Zuckerman, but we have received a sign, Edith, a mysterious sign. A miracle has happened on our farm. There is a large spider web in the doorway of the barn cellar right over the pig pen. Where Lurvy, when Lurvy went to feed the pig this morning, he noticed the web because of, it was foggy, and you know how a spider's web looks very distinct in the fog. And right spang in the middle of the web, there are the words, some pig. The words are woven right into the web. They were actually part of the web, Edith. I know because I have been down there and I've seen them. It says, some pig, just as clear as day. There can be no mistake about it. The, a miracle has happened and a sign has occurred right here on earth, right on our farm, and we have no ordinary pig. Well, said Mrs. Zuckerman, it seems to me you're a little off. Seems to me we have no ordinary spider. Oh, no, said Zuckerman. <laughs> it's the pig that's unusual. It says so right there in the middle of the web. Maybe so, said Mrs. Zuckerman, just the same. I intend to have a look at that spider. It's just a common gray spider, said Zuckerman. They got up and together they walked down to Wilbur's yard. You see, Edith, just a common gray spider. Wilbur was pleased to receive so much attention. Lurvy was still standing there and Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman, all three stood there for about an hour, just reading the words on the web over and over and watching Wilbur. Charlotte was delighted with the way that her trick was working. She sat without moving a muscle and listened to the conversation of the people. When a small fly blundered into the web just below the word pig, Charlotte dropped quickly down and rolled the fly up to carry it away. After a while, the fog lifted and the web dried off and the words didn't show up quite as plainly. The Zuckermans and Lurvy walked back to the house. Just before they left the pig pen, Mr. Zuckerman took one last look at Wilbur. You know, he said in with an important voice, I thought all along this pig was an extra good one. He's a solid pig. That pig is a, as solid as they come. You notice how solid he is around the shoulders, Lurvy? Sure, sure I do, said Lurvy. I've always noticed that pig. He's quite a pig. He's long and smooth, said Zuckerman. Oh, that's right, said Lurvy. He's as smooth as they come. He's some pig. When Mr. Zuckerman got back to the house, he took off his work clothes and put on his best suit. Then he got into his car and drove down to the minister's house. He stayed for an hour and explained to the minister that a miracle had happened on the farm. So far, said Zuckerman, only four people on earth know about this miracle. Myself, my wife Edith, my hired man Lurvy, and you. Don't tell anyone else, said the minister. We don't know what this means yet, but perhaps if I give some thought to it, I'll be able to explain it in my sermon next Sunday. There can be no doubt about it that you have a most unusual pig. I intend to speak about it in my sermon and point out the fact that our community has been visited with a wondrous animal. By the way, does your pig have a name? Why, yes, said Mr. Zuckerman. My little niece calls him Wilbur. She's rather odd, but full of notions. She raised the pig on a bottle, and I bought him when he was about a month old. Secrets are hard to keep. So long before Sunday came, the news spread all over the county, and everybody knew that a sign had appeared in a spider's web on the Zuckerman's place.
Everybody knew that the Zuckermans had a wondrous pig. People came from miles around to look at Wilbur and to read the words in Charlotte's Web. The Zuckerman's driveway was full of cars and trucks from morning till night. Fords and Chevys and Buick Roadmasters and GMC pickups and Plymouths and Studemakers and Packards and DeSotos. Oldsmobiles with rocket engines and Jeep station wagons and Pontiacs. The news of the wonderful pig spread clear into the hills and the farmers came rattling down in their buggies and buckboards to stand for hours and hours and stare at Wilbur's pen, admiring the miraculous animal. All said that they had never seen a pig like this in all their lives. When Fern told her mother that Avery had tried to hit the Zuckerman spider with a stick, Mrs. Arbel was so shocked she sent Avery to bed without any supper as punishment. In the days that followed, Mr. Zuckerman was so busy entertaining visitors that he neglected his farm work. He wore his good clothes all the time now, got right into them first thing in the morning. Mrs. Zuckerman prepared special meals for Wilbur. Lurvy shaved and got a haircut, and his principal farm duty was to feed the pig while people watched. Mr. Zuckerman ordered Lurvy to increase Wilbur's feedings from three times a day to four times a day. The Zuckermans were so busy with visitors, they forgot the other things on the farm. The blackberries got ripe, and Mrs. Zuckerman failed to put up any blackberry jam. The corn needed hoeing, and Lurvy didn't find time to do it. On Sunday, the church was full. The minister explained the miracle. He said that the words on the spider's web proved that human beings must always be on the watch for wonders. All in all, the Zuckerman's pig pen was the center of attention. Fern was happy for she felt that Charlotte's trick was working and that Wilbur's life would be saved. But she found that the barn was not nearly as pleasant. Too many people. She liked it better when she could be alone with her friends, the animals. Well, Charlotte has come up with a plan and it looks like it's working. We'll have to find out if that is really the case. Our um, activity sheet for today says, um, when the rotten goose egg exploded, there was a terrible smell. What are some terrible smells that you have experienced? Hmm. And then down in the bottom for our Bible connections, um, we're talking about miracles. Now they said this was a miracle. This is a pretend story. So we can't really say that this is a true miracle, but there are some Bible verses for you to look up for uh, to find some miracles from the Bible. And uh, before you do that, you might even want to sit down and make a list of as many miracles as you can think of that you know that happened in the Bible. That'll be kind of fun. Well, have a good uh, rest of the day and join us back next time to find out what's happening with Wilbur and Charlotte's plan to save his life. So we'll see you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>